Anna Lubachich was born on April 13th, 1981, apparently 1981, but according to what her age is online, which is 39, she was probably actually born in 1983, but this is not clear yet. But we know that she was born in Belgrade, Serbia. Her mother's name is Malanka. Her father has sadly passed, and she has a sister whose name is Alex, and she lives in Ontario, Canada. Anna attended the University of Belgrade right there in her beautiful, large home city in Serbia. And then in 2009, she attended Cornell University, which is an Ivy League school located in Ithaca, New York. And she was there to study hospitality management. But by the time that she was attending Cornell, she was already working in hospitality and had made her move to the United States, starting out as a housekeeping attendant at an inn in Virginia in 2005. And in 2008, when Anna was 25 years old, she met her to-be husband, Brian Walsh, while she was living in the Berkshires, working as the reservations manager for the Wheatley Hotel. Over the next seven years, Anna and Brian developed a relationship, living in a beautiful seaside suburb of Boston together and just building their life. Until 2015, when they married in Anna's home country of Serbia, and she became Anna Walsh. And she and Brian would have three sons together who are currently two, four, and six years old. Anna continued to work at hotels in Washington, D.C., and then in Boston until 2020, when she made a career change and began working in real estate. Then, in February of 2022, so almost a year ago from when this episode comes out, she began working as a regional manager for Tishman Spire, which is an American real estate company. So her real estate career has been in full swing. Now, because she works in Washington, D.C., she has a condo there that she could stay at because her actual family home that she shares with her husband, Brian, is located in Cohasset, Massachusetts, which is about an eight-hour drive away. So obviously, this is quite far to be a normal commute, so it's known that she would spend a good amount of time in both places. But when she was in D.C., she kept in contact with her husband and her kids every single day. But according to Anna's best friend, Alyssa, Anna was interested in moving permanently to Washington, D.C. and moving her kids down there in early 2023, so within the next couple of months. Cohasset is basically like an affluent seaside town of around 9,000 people just an hour from Boston. So Anna could fly to and from D.C. and Boston in an hour and 45 minutes, which she often did. Many people describe her as like ambitious, well-educated, and a very loving mother. And her friend Alyssa added to that saying, quote, she's personable, passionate, fun, joyful. She's someone who you want to get to know. She's so interested in everyone and everything. Just a really beautiful, wonderful, passionate, joyful woman. Brian, on the other hand, has some knocks against him. Not much is known about his life in general quite yet, But what we do know is he's an only child of Diana and Thomas Walsh III. His dad was a physician and Brian had a very privileged upbringing. But in 2012, Brian Walsh stole two Andy Warhol paintings from his friend and sold them. So this friend lived in South Korea and Brian told him that he would take the paintings to the U.S. and, you know, sell them for him. But when Brian arrived back to the U.S., he stopped answering this friend's phone calls completely. And then years passed. You know, obviously this friend is so upset. He had said something along the lines of how he would be so pissed if he didn't make money off of these paintings. Well, yeah. I mean, they're original Andy Warhols. Like, what? Yeah. And, like, Brian took them to sell them. So, obviously, this friend would never have let him do that if he didn't think that's what was going to happen. Exactly. But that's not what happened. So... Brian, basically, years later in 2016, he was able to sell the pair of paintings to someone in California for $100,000. And the buyer owns a Warhol gallery in LA, and this is why they wanted these paintings. But to avoid eBay fees, Brian offered a deal to sell off eBay for $80,000 instead, and the buyer agreed. But the buyer... Uh, you know, fully, basically the, the painting had like a uh, painting number 
and there's ways to kind of authenticate it. And this buyer who has bought many Warhol paintings over the years felt that the information that was given in the listing made it feel like it was legit. But that little stamp of um, authentication stamp of approval, yeah, authentication, yeah, that was hidden by the frame. So they're kind of like, oh, OK, you know, we'll go. We'll check them out. Everything's going to be fine. This seems legit. It just didn't seem like anything was weird. Anyway, sorry, I'm rambling now. But this is what the ad said before it went off eBay. We overpaid terribly in 2007 for the art. Price paid $240,000. We are trying to sell on eBay because it is much cheaper and because Christie's won't be able to auction our pieces until May 2017. But he's lying here because he did not buy these paintings. We know at least that at this point. However, once the deal went through and Brian cashed the check, the buyer looked at the art and removed the, the frames and realized that there was no authentication stamps from the Warhol Foundation because they were fakes. So the buyer then tried to contact Brian by phone nearly 20 times after this, but they were consistently ignored. He was he was selling the real ones, not to this buyer. Oh, um, but then he also had essentially made Prince. fake ones, right, to sell as if they were real to try to like double his money and, by the way, not give a dime to the friend that he took them from. Eventually, the buyer was able to find Anna through Brian and contact her and say, "Hey, what the hell is your husband doing?" And then because of this, she contacted Brian and said, you need to deal with this. He paid back $30,000 of the $80,000 and made various excuses of why he could not return the full amount. So the gallery eventually sued Brian for this matter in 2018. And in 2021, Brian pleaded to one count each of wire fraud interstate transportation to defraud, and possession of converted goods in unlawful monetary transaction. But he's still apparently awaiting sentencing on these charges. Though it seems that he was on some sort of house arrest and possibly probation, but we're not sure exact the exact limitations of this because obviously he was allowed to leave the house. And by the way, for the art fraud case, Anna's mom actually wrote a letter to the judge in May of 2022, and this is what it said. My name is Malanka Lubicic, and I am Anna's mother and Brian's mother-in-law. I live in Belgrade, Serbia. I'm writing to thank you for giving my son-in-law Brian mercy since last October. On December 21st, 2021, Brian found me experiencing what he thought was a stroke. He immediately got my daughter and called emergency services. I can safely say that without his presence, I would have not survived. He further continued to take care of me during my recovery at the house. He's making my diabetic meals daily. He was taking me to the, uh, to the doctor's appointments, etc. Now, almost six months later, I am making a full recovery in my country home in Serbia, and I look forward to seeing Brian, Anna, and my grandchildren again upon my return in November. Brian is a kind and loving man who always puts me at ease. He is there for me even when he's having a tough day. He always says that I'll get to see all of my grandchildren graduate from universities. Anytime I thank Brian for saving my life, he is quick to give credit to all those who are a part of my recovery. The doctors, my daughters, and you, Judge Woodlock. He made it clear that he was able to help me because of your mercy and that he was able to take me to doctor's appointments because you allowed it. The first responders who came to the house all knew Brian. They knew him from visits to the Cohasset Fire Station during the annual 9-11 service acknowledgement campaign, and this made me very proud of my son-in-law. I wish to thank you for my life and for a chance that you gave to my grandchildren to get to know me, as they had already lost both their grandfathers. Thank you also for giving Brian a chance to live a life worth living. Sincerely, Malanka. And here is what Anna wrote about Brian during this ordeal. Quote, He was taught to lie and hide. He was told that he was a loser, that his parents should have not had him, that he had no chances of making anything of himself in life, and that he was a lost cause. A deep sense of shame governed his life. She then went on to say that he had a big heart 
and was the love of her life. And us bringing these two things up, this is obviously directly about this art fraud case. I don't know how much of this is true on either of their parts. We're not trying to use their words against him for the present situation, sure. but it is just important to bring up everybody's accounts of him in the past and in the present. Yeah, and it's very interesting that Anna says that, you know, he was taught to lie. Very and to interesting. Hide. So Brian's mother, Diana, also wrote on Brian's behalf, stating, quote, My son is the only reason I get up in the morning. He is the only person to take care of me, and he, was al and he is always there for me. He is the main caregiver for all three of his sons. He cooks, shops, cleans, plays, communicates boundaries, and reads bedtime stories. However... Brian and his father were not close at all because Brian allegedly destroyed his father's will and stole almost $1 million from his father. So a close family friend who decided to remain anonymous told CBS News, quote, Brian was not like other young people. He was always dressed in Armani and penny loafers when he was like 13. I never saw him in dungarees. He just wanted the finest things in life. This is a kid who never gave his father an ounce of teenage angst. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. He didn't do drugs. He was very close and very respectful to his father. He was charming. And when he did this, when he stole the million dollars, allegedly, it like stabbed his dad in the heart. He was not trustworthy. He did something that was shameful and horrible to someone he cared about. So after Brian had allegedly or allegedly stolen money from his dad, they didn't speak for 10 years. And then Brian's father, Thomas, died in 2018, and he had cut Brian out of the will for what he had done to him. So Brian actually destroyed the will, allegedly, and appointed himself the personal rep of the estate, liquidating over $100,000 from bank accounts in his father's name. So the alleged stealing of $1 million from his father happened before the art fraud case, and then the changing of his father's will and taking over $100,000 was after. So clearly, very much money hungry. Back in 2014, so the year before Brian and Anna got married, Anna told the DC Metro Police that someone threatened to kill her and her friends. Now, many reports allege that this person that she was referring to was Brian, but apparently she didn't follow through with the charges and never named the person. Though, she made it seem as though it was the person that she was dating, which would have been Brian for six years at that point. Four months later, they were married. There's also a lot of discussions going around about an edited Instagram caption from 2018. We're covering all the bases. Yeah. The photo is on Anna's page, and it's a picture of her sitting on a couch with a busted up eyebrow. The original caption is currently unknown, but it was changed months later while her husband was in court for art fraud to read, quote, mild concussion, bruised hip, and a cut. Hashtag vulnerability. So some speculate that he was the one to hurt her and that she changed her caption to make it seem like it wasn't him. But we're not really sure why she would put domestic abuse on her Instagram. So this is pure speculation of what this could mean. Here is what Brian's dad's friend Fred had to say about an incident that he witnessed regarding Brian's violence. He said, quote, I witnessed firsthand what Brian was capable of. I saw Brian attempt to smuggle out antiquities from China. When Brian was confronted, he picked up a stanchion and literally attempted to kill four or five guards that had come to talk to him about his crime. Brian is not only a sociopath, but also a very angry and physically violent person. And this was said back in 2019 in an affidavit regarding the dispute over Brian's father's estate. So this was said well before Anna's disappearance. Right. So now that we've heard all different kinds of accounts on Brian's behavior, let's finally get to what this whole story is about. What happened to Anna? 39-year-old Anna Walsh was last seen on January 1st, 2023, New Year's Day. She spent New Year's Eve at home in Cohasset, hosting a dinner with her 46-year-old husband, Brian, and her friend, Jem. So according to Jem, Anna and Brian went to bed just after he left around 1 or 1.30 a.m. 
Anna had an apparent and sudden work emergency, so it was known at this dinner that she needed to leave for Washington, D.C. hours later to deal with whatever it is that was going on. After she was reported missing, Brian told police that Anna got ready to leave, you know, the morning of the 1st, and kissed him goodbye before he went back to sleep. She was to take a ride share, so an Uber or a Lyft, to the Boston airport between 6 and 7 a.m., so about six hours after her friend left, maybe five. As you've probably realized thus far, it doesn't feel like we can really trust what Brian says, but Anna was not seen after this, and it's been reported that she never ended up taking a car to the airport, nor did she make her flight to D.C. that morning that she had already booked in advance, by the way. That afternoon on January 1st at around 3 p.m., a babysitter arrived to watch Anna and Brian's three very young sons, and Brian told her that he was going to go get some groceries. Later, he explained to police that he went to his mom's house in Swampscott at about 4 p.m., and Swampscott is roughly an hour and a half drive from Cohasset, and he spent some time with her there. It should be noted that Brian did not have his cell phone with him during this time. And after being at his mom's house for apparently just 15 minutes, he said that he left to go to Whole Foods and CVS to run errands for his mom. But during this time that he was allegedly running these errands, he also told police that he got lost for like 30 minutes. So I would just be interested to know how well he knew Swampscott and that general area because his mom and his dad, when he was alive four years, four, almost five years ago, had lived in Swampscott for a long time. So they had been living there for many years and she still lives there right now. And I read in his dad's obituary that the dad is from Virginia, but that he moved to Boston very early in his career. So although we don't know right now where Brian grew up, it seems like it was likely Boston and Swampscott is just outside of it. So it's interesting that he claims he got lost when he likely knew this area quite well. Well, after running these supposed errands for his mom, he returned to Cohasset at around 8 p.m. that same night. So roughly five hours after leaving. But here's where things get really interesting. The day after this, on January 2nd, 2023, Anna's phone pinged for the last time in the area of their Cohasset home. And it had actually been pinging there both on the first and on the second. Two days, which Brian says that Anna wasn't home because she had left to go to DC. Well, on January 2nd, Brian told investigators that he took one of his sons for ice cream or a smoothie at Press Juice Bar in Norwell. Brian said that this is all he did that day in public, meaning that he hadn't gone anywhere else. And investigators were able to confirm that this smoothie trip did indeed take place. However, according to surveillance footage caught at a Home Depot in Rockland, Massachusetts, about a 30 minute drive from their home, Brian Wall shopped that day and spent nearly $500 on cleaning supplies, including gloves, mops, a bucket, tarps, and various kinds of tape. And he also paid in cash. And although Anna and Brian were apparently in the habit of speaking every day, even when she was out of town, especially so she could talk to her kids, she did not make contact at all after apparently leaving for DC. Though remember, there's no trace of her leaving for D.C. and she did not get on her flight. Two days later, so three days after Anna was last seen, her employer in D.C. called the police because she hadn't shown up for work in days and didn't call or reply to calls or emails either. Anna's last Instagram post is from December 31st, and it's of a quote that says, Take the risk of optimism. Before that, she posted one week earlier on December 23rd with a photo of her wearing a Washington Capitals hockey jersey at the game with the caption, officially a fan. The post before that was five days earlier on December 18th, and it was a video of four different cute like baby boy outfits with the caption, the Walsh boys' first outfits get a special frame. And in the video, you can kind of see like different frame options. So it appears that she was in the process of framing these outfits. 
The post before that was from the day before this on December 17th, and it's a five-photo post of her and one of her sons with the caption reading, Baby B turns two today. Like it was yesterday, we were on the way to MGH, which is the Massachusetts General Hospital, during a snowstorm in Boston. A few hours later, Baby B came at 10 and a half pounds and fully blonde to our surprise. Grateful for this recessive gene in his golden locks. Happy birthday, son. I love you. So basically, she posts on Instagram very frequently, like usually at least twice a week. And most of her photos are of her family, her kids, her travels, food, and her coworkers. And her Instagram bio reads, Confident, generous, loving leader, serving those who lead. So according to Brian's attorney, before Anna's employer called to report her missing, Brian had called them to ask if they knew where she was. And this is what prompted them to report her missing. Thus, Cohasset police arrived to the Walsh home for a welfare check. And that's when they spoke to Brian for the first time. And he explained the past few days. So after not hearing from her for three days, he wasn't even the one to officially report his wife missing. The next day, January 5th, the Cohasset police officially announced that 39-year-old Anna Walsh was missing and asked the public to come forward if they had any information regarding her whereabouts. The next day, on January 6th, police launched their first official search for her in the wooded areas of her home with rescue teams and canines. And that search continued into the next day as police searched for her on the ground and also determined that Brian had lied about going to Whole Foods and CVS the day that Anna went missing. He was unable to provide receipts and he was not captured on surveillance footage for either store that day. So because he flat out lied to them, the next day on Sunday, January 8th, Brian was arrested and charged with misleading a police investigation. I want to mention something weird that happened the same day that the official investigation began, which was on uh, January 6th. So on January 6th, a fire broke out at the Walsh's former house in Cohasset that they sold back in March of 2022. But this did seem to be some kind of like odd coincidence that occurred naturally due to damaged piping that was connected to a natural gas fireplace insert. So at first people are like, does is evidence being covered is this connected but it just seemed like a total weird coincidence yeah so strange yeah so after brian's arrest like i said is when a lot of other suspicious information came out like his involvement in art fraud the home depot trip etc well on monday january 9th the day after brian was arraigned in court and he pleaded not guilty in regards to misleading the police even though he's literally caught in multiple lies But considering he told them that Anna had taken a ride share when she hadn't and all the other lies, police felt that this really delayed their investigation. But even more disturbing were the details that were about to come up as police obtained a search warrant for their Cohasset home. Because inside, they found blood in the basement along with a bloody and broken knife. In addition to this horrific discovery, police also scraped Brian's internet searches and they found that he had looked up how to dispose of a 115 pound woman's body and how to dismember a body. Obviously, this was just sickening and incredibly suspicious. So, Police moved their search to a trash transfer station in Peabody, which is an hour's drive away from their Cohasset home, just hoping to find any trash that has uh, that had previously been at the Walsh home. And after pouring over surveillance footage around Swampscott and finding Brian near a dumpster on January 1st, the day he got lost, crime scene tape was put around said dumpsters in an apartment complex near Brian's mom's house in Swampscott. So if they found anything in there and in the transfer station, which it seems they may have, it has not yet been reported what those items were, but it's known that the state is currently processing and testing a number of items, which most certainly includes the blood found in the basement. We don't know everything that was found in the Peabody trash, but we do know some of it that was found. Apparently, 
They did find a hatchet, a hacksaw, a rug, cleaning supplies, and bloody towels in the Peabody Trash Facility, and it's believed to be connected to this case, but there are waiting DNA evidence. So as we mentioned earlier, Brian was on some sort of probation, and many of the trips that he made after Anna went missing had not been approved beforehand, which is a direct violation of the terms of his probation. So right now, other interesting information is coming out, including information from Mike and Mandy Silva, who are former tenants of the Walshes, since the Walshes have purchased, rented, and owned many other properties over the years, and have known them for eight years. Mandy said just this week, quote, Over time, within the last six months, things started to get really strange with the Walshes. Anna was selling all of her assets in the Boston area, including our unit, that they were in a rush to sell. Why are you in such a rush to sell our unit? It doesn't make sense. This was very out of character for them. Mike added, quote, They never stayed at a property for more than a year, So I figured maybe they're running from something or hiding from something. I mean, she sold all her properties and walked away with a lot of money. I think the most intriguing part is that she seemed to be in a rush to sell, if that is even true. Like, that just makes me wonder if she was trying to make money on her own so she could potentially leave Brian and bring the kids to D.C. like she told her friend she wanted to do. Right. But that is total speculation. I don't know how on par that is but also is something interesting mike had texted both anna and brian separately to say happy new year on uh, january 1st but anna of course never responded to this text but brian did yet not until january 2nd and his response was happy new year sorry for the delay i misplaced my phone and my son just found it regarding the blood that was found in the basement of the walsh home and in the peabody trash Once they determine whether or not it's Anna's, it would be really big for the case in her potential murder. Now, investigators are currently hoping to collect blood samples from Anna's sons so that they have a direct bloodline sample to be able to compare it and confirm or deny the identity of the DNA. The FBI and Cohasset police are still actively looking for information regarding this case and what happened to Anna Walsh. Brian Walsh is still in custody for misleading investigators and more serious charges are expected soon. The Department of Children and Families confirmed that all three Walsh boys are in their custody at this time. Former Boston U.S. attorney stated, quote, We haven't confirmed 100% what happened to her. We don't have a body. At the end of the day, you're going to want evidence that establishes proof that a certain act occurred and that there's no doubt about that. You want to make sure you get it right. Although the evidence already seems like a lot, it is largely circumstantial, but hopefully police will get answers soon for Anna's family. So if you know anything about what happened to Anna Walsh, please call the Cohasset Police at 781 383 one two one two for everybody out there in the world don't be a stranger 